Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. See, sometimes we get so busy during the week and during the day that we do not think about our spiritual condition. And our hearts become so hardened because we live in the physical, we do not think in the spiritual. And we need to ask God to open up the eyes of our heart. And during the invitation today, Justin is going to sing that song. We all know it. Open the eyes of my heart, O Lord. Why does God want us to open the eyes of our heart? It's because I truly believe that we are never going to be the person God wants us to be unless we are in tune to the spiritual condition that God has called us in. Sometimes we live in the physical, but we do not see the spiritual. And there's a passage found in Mark chapter 10. It's talking about a blind man that was a beggar by the gate of Jericho. And I used this passage not too long ago, but there's so much importance to what blind Bartimaeus saw with his heart. And I want to read this scripture to you, and it's a phenomenal scripture. But I want to get this point across. Jericho is about 15 miles from Jerusalem. And Jesus was walking through Jericho to go to Jerusalem to die on the cross. So this man is the last miracle, the last healing that Jesus ever performed on the physical walk on this earth. It was the last conversion until he got on the cross. When he got on the cross, there was two conversions at the cross. Do you know who they were? The thief. This day, you'll be with me in paradise. And the centurion soldier at the foot of the cross said, this must be the son of the living God. Those are the last two conversions. But Jesus touched this guy's life and he changed him forever. It starts in verse 46. Now they came to Jericho. As he went out of Jericho with his disciples, a great multitude, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. And when he had heard that he was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then many warned him to be quiet, but he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood and commanded him to call and called him. And they called him the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer, rise, he is calling for you. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. So Jesus answered and said to him, this is the most important part of the scripture, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabbi, that I might receive sight. Then Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. In Mark chapter 10, there's all kinds of questions that was asked of Jesus. But this is the most important question that you and I have to ask. Jesus wants us to ask a question, what do you want me to do for you? And you know what? Jesus asked that question and the blind man could have said, I want you to refer a doctor to me. I want you to bless me. But some of the so shortest prayers, Lord, I just want to see. I just need you to heal me. He doesn't have to have the King James Version of a prayer about 15 minutes long. This guy just said, Lord, I just want to see. I'm tired of begging. I'm tired of going through this life. I'm tired of being miserable. Lord, I just need you to heal me. And sometimes Jesus is asking us that same question. What do you want me to do for you? And sometimes before we can answer that question, Jesus already knows the answer to that question. And sometimes you know what you need to ask for when Jesus asks you that question. But the answer would be, are you truly prepared for God to do what he's asked of you? If you said, Lord, I need you to heal me from drinking, from gambling, from pornography, 
Are you really prepared for Jesus to heal that? See, this guy was begging, and we don't know if he was blind from birth or whether it was a health defect, but this guy was sick and tired of being blind and being a beggar, and Jesus came by. He didn't see Jesus. He didn't know Jesus. He heard of Jesus, and he said, Jesus is coming by, the Son of God, my last chance and we have no idea when our last chance will be. Jesus left Jericho, went to Jerusalem, and died on the cross. This guy's last chance to be healed was this moment. And God gave him that opportunity. And when God gives you an opportunity to open your eyes of your heart, then you must take it. You must be able to see that. See, we know a lot of blind people, don't we? We've heard of a few people. Helen Keller, the great hymn writer Fanny Crosby, Ray Charles, and Stevie Wonder. And they were all good blind people. But I want to tell you a story about the most significant blind person that I have ever met. Very simple name, Bob Smith. <laughs> Doesn't get any more common than that, right? I worked for Bob Smith for four years. And I've said this story a few times, but he impacted my life above measure. Every morning at 8.30, I'd pick him up at his house and drive him to his office. And from 8.30 to 11.30, every morning, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Saturday, we sat in his office, and I would read the Bible to him. We'd listen to John MacArthur on audio tapes, and we would just study for three hours. And it taught me how to study. I'm an audio learner. I'm not a reader. I'm an audio learner, just like he was. And I learned so many things about how you cannot allow the blindness to hinder what God wants us to do. And Bob was a great communicator, great jokester, and he was a great pastor. And I learned so much from him. One thing I learned from him is you cannot let the distractions of your life hinder what God wants you to do. So often we look at our weaknesses or our hindrances or insecurities and we say, because I have this, I can't serve Jesus. Or because I'm healed, hurt, I can't do what God wants me to do. Because I was hurt in a church before, I can't serve God in a church now. You know what? We have to put the past behind us and we have to open up our eyes and say, Lord, what do you really want me to do? The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, without faith it is impossible to please God. For without who comes from God must believe that he exists, that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. If you want to be rewarded by God, we have to diligently seek after God. What does that word mean? That means open up our height and say, Lord, what are you trying to teach me today? What are you giving to me? I need you to bless me. I need you to reward me. But he's just not going to send out blessings on every issue of our life, especially when we're living in sin. But what he says is, I want to bless you, but here's what I need you to do. I need you to diligently open up your eyes of your heart and say, Lord, teach me. When he says, what do I want you to do? Or what do you want me to do for you? It has to be, I want you to open my eyes and to heal my hurts. But without faith, it is impossible to please God. So I want to give you a couple points on faith, and then I want to talk about some other things. The first, faith believes even when you cannot see. Faith, the evidence of things not seen. We have to have faith that God can take care of us. We have never seen Jesus. We have never seen God with our physical eyes. But those that have faith in God have seen Jesus spiritually. The Holy Spirit of God lives within us. We have faith that Jesus can heal us, that can change us. It'd be great, it'd be great if Jesus said, you know what, I'm gonna show up at Glenville today. And I'm gonna show up at Glenville and I am going to heal every one of your eyes, every one of your hearts, every issue within your life. And if Jesus came on this platform and healed every one of us, this parking lot would be packed the next Sunday, right? Because if we could see Jesus, it would not be by faith faith, it would be by sight. And the Bible says we must come to Jesus by faith. In other words, we have to understand that Jesus loves us, not because we see him, it's because what he has done for us. And this blind guy said this, 
When he had heard that Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. When he heard that Jesus was coming, when he had heard what Jesus has done in the past for the last three years, and now he has the opportunity to be healed by the very Son of God, he did not let anybody stand in his way. This blindness was not going to hinder what God wanted him to do. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we walk by faith, not by sight. So the blind man could not see Jesus, but his heart said, this is the Son of God. And so often we live by sight. We want to see Jesus. We want to experience what Jesus has, but we close the eyes of our heart we harden our heart because of pain, because of a past church experience, because of a mom or because of a dad or because of a preacher. We hardened our heart because somebody hurt us, because somebody said something that you didn't like. Or maybe you were growing up and your mom and dad made you go to church when you were five years old and you hated church. Now you're 18, 15, 25 years old and you say, you know what? I may not have liked my mom and dad's church, but I love Jesus. And I need to open my eyes to the heart and say, Lord, tell me what to do. You may have walked away from God for the last 20 years, but you're here today and you ask God, open the eyes of my heart. And when you ask God to do something like that, God can change every issue within your life. The second thing, faith resists the barriers to Christ. This guy was shouting, Son of David, have mercy on me. And the disciples said, Shh, this is Jesus. Quit bothering him. And they said, He even shouted even louder when they told him not to. You know, there, there's a group of people that used to be called the Shouting Baptist. Okay? That's meant when you agreed with something the preacher said, what would you do? Amen! Let's try that. Shout it out. You, the word shout in this area was crazen. Crazy. Now, I don't mind you. Now, we have one crazen. It's right here. She's a crazy woman, okay? But you know what she does? She shouts out. We cannot allow this world to hinder us from doing what God has called us to do. So if you hear the word of God and you agree with the word of God, let's say... I'm, there we go, crazy woman right there. Amen. But see, this guy, blind Bartimaeus, or we could call him Bart, when somebody says, shut up, he said, no way. My only hope, my only opportunity to be healed is Jesus. And I am not going to allow anyone or anything stand in the way of Jesus healing me spiritually. And so I... So, now you're gonna get me off track all the time. But so often, so often, we are not shouting Baptist, we're sleeping Baptist. We come to church, and if it isn't my way, it's the highway. If I don't like what somebody says, I'm gonna be mad. And you know what? What we have to do is stand up for what the Bible says, what Jesus says, and if we agree with what the Bible says, what Jesus says, and hopefully what the preacher says, we can shout and be a crazy Baptist shouting. We have to be able to do that. We cannot allow the barriers to stop us from coming to Jesus. And you cannot allow the barriers to stop you from talking to people about Jesus. Amen. Blind Bartimaeus became a follower and a disciple of Jesus Christ because he would not allow the religious disciples to stop him from hearing about Jesus. See, did you hear that? Those that already had faith in Jesus was trying to stop somebody from having faith in Jesus. And so often, now I'm gonna offend somebody here. I'm just telling you that up front, okay? Amen. I'm preaching here now. <laughs> the church has hindered sometimes the work of Jesus. The arrogance, the pride of the church, of you and me. When somebody needed Jesus, 
I'm too busy. I'm hurting. I don't want to do that. And they're shouting out, Lord, I need you. And we, the church, are Christ-like followers of Jesus. We're supposed to be his eyes, his ears, and his feet. So when somebody cries out, I need help. Same thing as blind Bartimaeus said, I need to see. And if we are Christ-like followers of Jesus and we are following after Christ, it is our job to help them come to Christ and not to be the barrier. Shh, shut up. Quit yelling. Quit talking to Jesus. No, our job of this world is not to come to church and be satisfied. The calling of God on our life is to be the ambassadors for Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We've got a couple crazies in here. <laughs> the third thing, faith admits the need to be changed. Faith admits the need to be changed. This man knew his only hope was in Jesus. His only hope. And I can tell you this, your only hope to be changed is Jesus. It's not me, it's not the church, it's not the psychologist. It's Jesus. So when we understand, like blind Bartimaeus, that I needed Jesus, he said, I need to change. But Jesus looked at him and knew his heart. And he asked this question, what do you want me to do for you? I want to see. I want to see. He admitted he needed to change. But Jesus was asking this question because blind Bartimaeus, if he received his sight, he's not going to be a beggar anymore. He's not going to sit at the gate asking for money and he's going to maybe have to get a job. You ready for this? Sometimes in our sin, when we ask Jesus to heal us, we have to make a change. The Bible says, repent, turn from your wickedness, back to what God wants us to do. If Jesus is coming into your life and he says, what do you want me to do for you? I want to see. I want to quit whatever your sin is. He is saying, okay, repent. I cannot heal you. I cannot bless you. I cannot give to you the things of God if you're continuing in the sin that you're in. What you have to do is if you're going to receive God's blessing, you're going to have to stop doing your sin. Are you sure you want Jesus to heal you? My question is, are you sure you want to stop doing what you're doing? Because if you're not willing to stop, Jesus probably won't bless you. But the fourth point, and I want to spend some time on this, is spiritual blindness can be more damaging than physical blindness. Jesus recognized this man needed hope and needed help. He said, leave them. Talking to the Pharisees. He said, leave them. They are blind guides. If the blind leads the blind, both will fall into the pit. What we have to do, we are not called to be Pharisees. We're not called to tell everybody what they're doing wrong. We're not the sin police. What we are is we're ambassadors. Jesus was always full of grace. Which means this. There's going to be things in your life. There's going to be kids that you have that are going to do stupid things. Somebody give me an amen. amen. I got one of them here with me today. They're doing <laughs> stupid things. I could either do this, Lori. I could either do this. I could either say, nope. I don't want you around me anymore. Or we could love them, teach them, encourage them, and be the Christ-like examples to them that Jesus has called us to do. It's your call. Do you want to be the ambassador or do you want to be the Pharisee? See, I don't want to be a Pharisee. I don't want to be a police officer. What I want to do is I want to be full of grace. Jesus was full of grace. This last miracle... Jesus knew that within a week, he was going to die. But he saw a man that was hurting. He could have walked right on by. I'm busy. I don't, I don't want to mess with you. But he saw the man's heart. And he says, stop. 
when this man cried out, Son of David, have mercy on me. You know what Jesus did? He stopped. He stopped going to the cross for your sins and my sins is because blind Bartimaeus needed his sins forgiven. So he stopped. Here's what Jesus does for us. When we cry out and say, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, Jesus stops. And he says, what do you want me to do for you? And when we open up our eyes and say, I need this or I need that, Jesus looked at him and said, your faith, not your sight, your faith has healed you. And when his faith healed him, he got up and he followed Jesus. Sometimes we come to church and we ask Jesus to be our Santa Claus, to give us, give us, give us, give us, but we don't follow after Jesus after he has taken care of us. So let me give you a couple points. You may be blind to the truth about Jesus. You may be blind to the truth about Jesus. And here's why sometimes we are blind to the truth. It's because the Bible is very clear on what takes place in this world. And it's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. The God, little g, of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Jesus Christ, who is the image of God. So this culture that we're living in has been blinded to the very fact of who Jesus was and who Jesus is. So what happens if this culture is blinded by Satan, the deceiver, the liar of this world, but you have opened up your heart to understand who Jesus is, but this world does not want to see Jesus, you are Jesus. If they do not see Jesus in the Bible, they do not see Jesus with their eyes, but we are professed followers of Jesus Christ, how are we doing with our profession? How are we doing with the way that we live? If people do not believe in Jesus through the Bible, but you come to church and they're saying, why do you come to church? Well, because I want to worship Jesus. <laughs> no way. But then you go to work the next day and you cuss like a sailor. Hmm. Yeah, how's that Jesus thing going for you? Because we are his ambassadors. And what we must do is we must stand up for him. If Satan has blinded the eyes of this world, but you have opened the eyes of your heart, we must be Jesus everywhere around us. The English novelist Samuel Butler said this, a blind man knows he cannot see and is glad to be led, though it by a dog. But he that is blind is not understanding which is the blindness of all. And he believes that he can see the best and he scorns everything that happens. A blind man says, I just need help. But somebody that can see, they get upset. They don't understand what's going on. See, you may be blinded to the God-given potential of others. There's a great story about this. I was trying to find a clip with that, but it was too long. I didn't think you wanted to watch a five-minute clip. Do you, if I said a name, it's going to come back probably 20 years ago. And if some of you young punks, you probably won't understand this. But us old guys, I turned 55 this week. So I'm now, Al said I can get my senior citizen's discount now. <laughs> woo -hoo! That's exciting, isn't it? I'm going to say a name. And raise your hand if you know who this person is, okay? Susan Boyle. You remember Susan Boyle? She was on talent show. I think it was British talent show. And she walked out. She was kind of dumpy and really didn't look like she was all there. And, and she said that she wants to sing, I have a dream, or I dream a dream. And uh, Mr., what's his name? Simon Cow, you guys know better. Simon Cow looked in, kind of smirking. They looked at each other and laughed at her. And, and they said, there's no. How did you get this far? And she, kind of shy and scared to death. And the music started. And their eyes opened wise. 
because this little old lady sang a beautiful song. And by the end of that song, the entire audience was standing up, giving her a standing ovation. And I thought about that during this point. Sometimes we look at people and we say, you can't do that. Or you shouldn't do that. Sometimes we do not see the potential that other people have. And we keep them down instead of setting, go ahead and sing your song. And once they sing or once they serve or once they do something, we are giving them a standing ovation because what they can do. But sometimes with our blindness, we do not see the potential of other people. And because of this, sometimes when we do not see the potential of others, they do not see the potential in themselves because they will not try because most people are insecure in certain areas. Are you insecure in a area? Raise your hand. Okay, everybody should have both hands up, both feet up, and we're, we're, there's always insecurities. The ones that are the most insecure are the ones that act like they're not insecure. We have insecurities. We have our failures. But what happens is somebody says you can't. Sometimes we believe that I can't. But when somebody says you can, it gives you potential to try. And once you have the potential to try and you have success, then you can stand and do what God has called you to do. You being blind may keep somebody from doing what God has called them to do. But what we can do is we can encourage them. A spouse, a kid, a student, we can encourage them. That's what I like about camp this week. We're at, we're gonna, at the end of the service, we're going to have kids coming across here and all these people are going to camp. And we have, I think, 70 some kids going to camp. And some of you guys have to cook and <laughs> clean up after them and do counseling. And I pray for you. But um, what's awesome is there's no cell phones. There's no computers. It's just God. And there's one thing that they're going to do. They're going to unplug their life. And they're going to plug into Jesus. And what they can do when they get plugged into Jesus is change their life. See, here's what happens sometimes. Sometimes parents, and here I go again. Are you ready for this? Sometimes parents care more about the trophy on the shelf that's going to be dusty in five years than they do about the spiritual condition of their child. And five years after that child graduates from high school and the trophies are over with, and that child is not walking with God, but you spent all this money getting those trophies to put on your shelf to say, that's my son or that's my daughter. And those trophies are now in the closet or now they're in the trash and your kid is walked away from God because you spent all the time playing the game instead of talking to them about Jesus. So, so often the potential that we give to somebody by giving them an opportunity to see Christ. And then you may be blinded to God's purpose for your life. Blinded to the purpose of your life. In Ephesians chapter 1, we just read it. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. We are all his ambassadors. We are all his prayer warriors. God's purpose for your life can change. It can be an ebb and flow of the situation that you're in. The sphere of influence that you have the defining moment that you're in, he has a purpose for you. And what we must do with that purpose is say, Lord, I just want to be your vessel. We have to open the eyes of our heart. We can all see. We all know what's going around us. But to open the eyes of our heart is to be intentionally looking at a spiritual condition. See, I know many of you and I've done counseling with a lot of you. And I know that there's things in our past that are keeping us from doing what God wants us to do into the future. There are pains and sorrows and hurts growing up that has devastated you, that's hardened you. I've talked to many of you about your church life growing up and um, the domineering church parents. And you say, you know what, I just... I just don't want anything to do with that. And I, I want to say this with all due respect. You have to make your own decision. 
Your mom and dad can't make you a believer. God is not going to make you. What we can do is we have to have our faith in Jesus that he can change our life. And here's what he can do. He can forgive you of your mistakes. You can forgive others of their mistakes. But to say when Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? A very simple thing is, I need a clean heart. I need to forgive those that have hurt me. And I need to ask God to forgive me for hurting others. And that's the openness and the tenderness of the heart of God. God, through his son Jesus, was always full of grace. Always. So, if God is full of grace, what we can do is be grace-filled. Being willing to forgive. Being willing to ask for forgiveness. And say, Lord, I need you to help me. I need you to open the eyes of my heart. I'm not going to live in the past. Matter of fact, I'm going to take my key out. I'm going to lock the door to the past. I'm going to paddle lock it. I'm going to shut that door up. And I'm going to turn and I'm going to say, today is a brand new day. Lord, you stopped in your tracks when a crazy woman said, hallelujah. I need Jesus. And when we step out of our comfort zone and we open up our eyes of our heart, I love what Jesus did. He stopped. He turned to the person that was crying out for him. Crying out. Not sleeping, but crying out. The invitation, as Justin's singing right now, why don't you come on up, is open the eyes of my heart. I want you to be a participant today. We all have our stuff. We all need Jesus to change us, to open up our eyes, to see others as Jesus wants to see them, as to change our past, to get rid of the stuff that we were hurt by, whether it's a church or a parent or a school or a coach or a pastor, and say it's not about anyone else. It's about Jesus. And if he can open up our eyes, he can reward us, change us, and heal us. Will you please stand to your feet? This song of invitation is an opportunity for us to say, Lord, I need you to change me. Dear Father, Lord, as we offer this opportunity, as you are here today in our presence, through the power of the Holy Spirit that has indwelt every believer, we ask you, Lord, to open up our hearts, open up our eyes so we can see what you really want us to do. And Lord, forgive us change us and start fresh and new within us we ask you for that in jesus name we pray amen open the eyes of my heart it's your invitation to stop jesus in his tracks to help you in your life open the eyes of my heart
open the eyes of my heart I want to see yes I want to see Well, God does great and wonderful things in our lives, doesn't he? We're so glad that he does so. Thank you, Pastor Bruce. And sometimes our hearts are really, really closed. Mine's been there before, and you never know when it may be there. So just a couple announcements that I have. We're going to be praying for our young people going to camp. And they're going to have a great time. Uh, Pastor Bruce needs one more bowling team. And so if you'd like to be on that bowling team, um, you can sign up at the double doors to my right. And they got space there just for you. And then we also need some more people playing golf. Um, Pastor Bruce was talking about cussing like a sailor. If you want to get practice on that, a good place is out on the golf course. Uh, you know, the old saying is, hit the ball and cuss, hit the ball and cuss. <laughs> well, we don't do that, but you hear a lot of that, right, Tim? You hear a lot of that out there, don't you? But we'd la we need a couple more teams, and so if you'd like to sign up for the golf tournament, sign up out at the tall tables to my right, and uh, Doug Clausen will be out there. We need your money also, $45 per player, and we've got some envelopes out there that you can uh, put the money in. Be sure and put golf on that, so we'll get that money going to the right place. Come on, guys, let's have a good time out. Uh, you know, the only reason I'm going is to beat Pastor Bruce. And, you know, he's 55 now. I think I can finally beat him, okay? Got that discount, first discount, man. That's fun, wasn't it? <laughs> What's that? Yeah. Here's the guy right here who could hit that club, okay? I'll take it. Okay, you got it. I'll my bag. All right. Thank you. If you're visiting today, we're glad that you're here, and uh, I've seen a couple of visitors today, and we're so glad that you're here. And there's a little card in the chair in front of you. If you take that card and fill it out, place it in an offering place at the end, we'd appreciate it very much. You see the card up on the screen. We appreciate and we're honored that you're here today, and thank you for coming to Glenville and to worship with us today. We thank you. Pastor Bruce will be out to tall tables, out bowling, and he'd like to say hi to our visitors, so please drop out and to see him. Ushers, why don't you come and go receive the offering. Heavenly Father, we come into your presence today and we thank you, Father, for the greatest gift ever given to mankind, your Son, Jesus Christ. And Father, no way that we can ever repay you. And you don't ask us to do that. But Father, we can give to you because we love you. And Father, because we want to be obedient to you. So I pray, Father, that you bless the offering today. Bless the gift and the giver. We just praise your name. Father, open our eyes up to you. There's so much more about you than what we've ever seen. So, Father, bless the offering today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
video kind of cool? Connie does an excellent job on those every week, and she also helps me tremendously making me fancy little things to send home with your kids. So today, I have a couple of announcements, and your children will be coming out of Kid City with a lot of papers that are super important that you'll want to look at. So the first thing is we have our jailbreak VBS, which starts in one week. So a couple of things. It's a free thing for you to bring your kids, three-year-old that are potty trained through the fifth grade. It'll be Monday through Thursday night, and it's totally free. Just come here and fill. We would love to have them register beforehand so we can have a better idea of how many are coming. You can still sign up that night. But if you haven't done so, they have a table out here. Also, if you signed up to bring a couple of the items that they're asking for the crafts, we would love for you to get those turned in so, um, to Susie or Sam. That way we can be prepared. Um, the next thing, we have a lot going on this summer. I don't know if you guys are excited, but we have so much going on for the kids and the families, so we hope you'll join us. But we also have Kids Camp is in July. Now, last week, your kids should all have these registration forms today. They were due for the early bird pricing. We're going to go ahead and extend it until next Sunday. If you want to pay for your kids' camp in July, it's $35 for them to come. If you pay after next Sunday, it's going to go up to $45 a kid. So check that out. It's going to be a lot of fun. Also, this Friday night is going to be triple play. It's our last triple play for the school year. So it's for our fourth and fifth graders. So if you have them, we're having a big scavenger hunt here. It's 6 to 8 p.m. Just bring them to the door, and I'll take them in. I had to bring notes with myself because I always forget announcements. Um, and then the next thing is, at our 930 service, I would love to invite you. If you have kids that aren't coming at 930 so far, we would love to have them. We're doing what's called a super sleuth spy party over the next couple of weeks. Basically, we're following the story of a kid named Carlos, and he's trying to figure out all these clues. So the kids have been awesome. We've been playing spy games. They're trying to figure out um, the clue. One of them got it today. The clue's like, 1 Thessalonians 5.18, which is our verse that we're trying to memorize, and I just spelled it out for them, and one of the kids was like, because oh, they're connecting it, so hopefully soon, don't tell them. They'll know that's what the code is, but um, they're going to be getting a form like this, too, just to invite someone to come, and on the back, we're trying to talk to them about what we're thankful for. If they fill this out and bring it back, they're going to get a cool prize, so if you would just encourage them to come at 9.30, we would super love to have them. And I think, I'm hoping, the last thing I have is nursery. If anybody is interested in helping in nursery, especially over the summer, we've got a lot of people traveling and coming and going, and we've got a lot more babies joining us. So we would love to have a couple more helpers. And Sherry Smith is back there right now. If you would be willing to help out once a month, we would really encourage and love the help. And I lied. There's one more. Next Sunday is for all of you. We are having our first um, summer fun day, and we're going to be meeting out at Sedgwick County Park immediately following church. So what we're asking you guys to do is to pack your own picnic lunch, bring your chairs and your blankets. If you have any yard games, we already have several people who brought some cornhole. We've got giant dice, giant cards. We have sand volleyball. There's a park right there. Anything, I mean, bring a basketball, whatever. We're just going to spend a couple hours in the afternoon just fellowshipping as a family. Um, so that is next Sunday, immediately following service. We'll head out to Sedgwick County Park for a couple hours and just hang out. So we would love to have everybody there and just uh, spend some time having some fun. So um, Josh, I believe, is coming. All right. Well, um, we tomorrow are preparing for a big day. The youth are leaving for summer camp. And it is, this is a huge deal for our kids. Um, I know a lot of you have kids that have been to Falls Creek and you've probably heard about it, but Falls Creek is seriously one of the coolest places on earth. So at this time, I just want to have the students come in and line up here. So if they would come, just have the students walk in. This is about half of the Glenville students that are going. They're not all here, but they're going to come up here and stand up here. I just want you guys to see them, have to stare at them for a minute. They love it. They love being right at the center front. Just stand right down here in the front on the floor. And just spread it on out. So this is only about half of the students that are going from Glenville. Plus we're pairing up with a church in Clearwater. Um, they're bringing about 20 students as well. It's going to be a great time. Um, real quick, just to get this out of the way. If you are a parent that is going to be dropping off one of the students, we need the drop off to be at 845 tomorrow morning. Um, but as far as cool things that are going on, we're going to get to bed really early all week. Um, we're, it's going to be all focused on Christ, and we are going to, we're just going to spend a lot of time in the Word. All the kids are going to be real chill and calm all week. Here, will you guys scoot down this way? we got kids that are about to be shoved out the door. Um, 
So this week at Falls Creek, the, um, the theme is finish. Um, I don't know if we had a slide or something. I'm sorry, I didn't, get, I didn't like prepare it. But we, um, we have been focusing a lot, um, trying to get focused on, on the meaning of camp, the point of camp. And like what we were just talking about in youth group today was that most kids and a lot of times adults too will volunteer or they'll go to camps like this to, to search for a deeper, stronger experience with Christ. And we're kind of looking at it from a different angle. And what we're, what we focused on uh, for a couple lessons before this and then t today was that we want to learn and focus on the fact that we at Glenville understand that you do not have to go to camp to get a deeper relationship with Christ. And that we, a lot of times, are going to go to camp and we'll find that we're worshiping the experience that we're going on. And what we're trying to work on is that these students down here will be mature enough to be able to discern what the distractions are and what the things are that will get them closer to Christ. So I'm challenging them, and it's tough, because I, was a, I went to camp as a student at Falls Creek, and this place is crazy. But I challenge them to be able to look, I asked them that, that they would look at every situation that they face at camp, because most of them are just going to be extremely fun things that they're going to get opportunities to do. I challenge them to look at each and every situation and discern whether or not that situation that they're in is actually going to get them closer to Christ or if it's just a distraction. Because I know that camps, even though they have, um, they have a great heart and they're trying to get students closer to Christ and usually they're successful. I want them to be able to discern whether or not that's actually going to be a successful thing for them when they choose what they do at camp. Because they're sacrificing, you guys are sacrificing your time and your money, and I want that to be a great spiritual experience for them. So at this time, Pastor Bruce is going to come forward. What's up? Oh, 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 I'll announce that too. Okay, I thought you were doing it. My bad. Okay, so on the steps here, I have bracelets with the students' names um, and the counselors' names and the cooks' names if you're in here. The cooks can even come forward. I would ask if you're in here and you're going to be volunteering as a cook that you'll come forward and that the volunteers, everyone who's going to be going to camp with us, I'd like for you to come forward. Um, I have a bracelet here with everyone's name on it that, that's up here. Um, and I would like families in the church, individuals in the church to come forward and take a bracelet, put it on, and throughout the week, read the name and pray for that person and just keep them on your mind and on your heart and pray that um, that, that person's having a good spiritual experience that they're, and that Christ um, is being shown through them and that they'll come home someone closer to Christ. That's what the bracelets are for and that's for definitely for the kids, but really we need you praying for the counselors too. The volunteers, they're going to have, they're going to be tired when they get home. They're going to sleep all day. If you see them at church on Sunday, we need to give them some props because they're going to want to sleep all the way until work on Monday. So at this time, Pastor Bruce is going to pray for us and give us a dedication. You know, Josh, the thing is, how would they sleep during my sermon on Sunday morning? That's the thing. They were, they were going to want to, but they will get up to come hear you there preach you on Sunday morning. <laughs> there you go. So uh, here's what I'd like to do. We have how many bracelets down here? About 70 bracelets. I'd like to have you come down if you, if you commit to this. Just don't come down to get a bracelet. If you commit to come down and take a bracelet, and every morning you look at that bracelet and you call that person by name and you pray for him or pray for her. So once you come down and get a bracelet, I want you to come down and stand after you get the bracelet, and we're going to have a prayer not only for our students, not only for our counselors, not only for our cooks. There's seven to 10,000 kids at that camp. Comprehend that. Seven to 10,000 kids. Imagine... If seven to 10,000 kids opened their eyes to their heart and followed after Christ for the rest of their life, wouldn't this week of camp be worth anything that we could ever pay for or pray for? Let's get that a round of applause. Amen. So I'm going to have the guys um, play a song for about three minutes as you come down to get the bracelets and then come down and stay with the students. And then I want to have a prayer of dedication. So would you all please stand? Let's play. And then we'll have a time of prayer.